Seti Donihi Hoikoro, who I will be referring to as Seti from this point on for obvious reasons, is unique within the story of Hunter x Hunter. I think it's fair to say that he stands apart, he's on a different plane, and he's just cut from a different cloth. And I realize that one could say that about a number of characters from this magnificent and diverse cast, but there are levels to this, and Seti is on another one. And I think a big reason for that is because of how he functions as a foil. He's actually similar to every significant antagonist in some way, along with a key protagonist or two, with dynamics all over the place. But because of the way in which he foils and contrasts them all, he is wholly unique. Now, how exactly does this work, and what makes him stand out so much? Let's see. Seti is, outwardly, the picture-perfect personification of elegance and worldliness. He has a wide range of interests, but the common thread among them is that they all involve what is by his standards the highest level of human achievement, the top class of sport, aesthetics, philosophy, and general human peaks. And he is able to appreciate this because he knows of the process himself, being sharpened to a fine point in both mind and body. However, while I would not call this a veneer, as it is part of the genuine sense of self that forms his core, it is an exaggeration needed for appearances, and that exaggeration is quite thin. Hidden not so deep under the niceties and posturing is a disquieting monster, with an ego whose grandiosity is only rivaled by his evil, as Theta can attest to, having learned more than enough to make that claim. As a lover of fine art, Seti indulges, but his interests are not limited to conventional ones, and chief among them is human slaughter and the collection of body parts such as the Kurta's scarlet eyes and many other examples. However, that end is not the core of his passion, which can simply be defined as the search for pure, raw, unfiltered reactions that occur when beautiful young cultured people, usually women, are subjected to extreme situations, those usually involving mortal peril, high emotional distress. The need for these people to be cultured is key, and integrated with the rest of his characterization as well. Not just anyone can serve as the foundation for his art. Only those who pass a certain threshold of sophistication, aesthetic, and knowledge are worthy and satisfying to involve in these throes of passion, and that is because he stands on a pedestal above literally everything else and as a result, he simply deserves a standard of acceptable quality. Seti views himself as the apex of human creation, perfection personified. Anyone else in the world is by default significantly inferior due to the inherent reason that they are not him. And the logic for this is likely an amalgamation of several different factors. Firstly, Seti was someone who was born into royalty. The Kakin princes all came into a world that worshipped the ground they stepped on and were immediately taught that they are superior to everyone. Their will was right and good, and others should be proud to lay down before them for whatever their whims fancied. From their perspective, the world exists to bend to them. However, not all of the children here got the exact same treatment, not all of them ended up the same and took the same lessons away, and Togashi is obviously too skilled a writer to have that be the simple reason for this when Seti is wholly unique, even from his siblings. And part of this is key to a thematic motif present throughout the entire story, that of nature versus environment and nurture. We'll get to this later, but part of the reason that these lessons and ideas stuck so firmly is that Seti is simply a horrifically evil person, and I don't say that lightly. As we'll discuss, at every opportunity he has a chance to walk towards the light, he spurns it and instead heads towards an even bleaker darkness. So he's taken this idea and runs with it. Additionally, having such a love for art and impressiveness and aesthetics, he has molded himself into that ideal. He is the most beautiful, the most intellectual, and since he has reached this pinnacle that is unsurpassable, no others are capable of approaching him. This is a big part of the reason why he has such disdain for a lot of his siblings despite them being born on more or less equal standing. Because while they have the power and influence, they lack his specific type of dark conviction, his intelligence and knowledge, or his beauty and physical prowess. As others have posed to me, it's likely not a coincidence that he shows Hulkenberg a modicum of decency, with the latter having achieved feats of education and sport. Seti was born into royalty and art, and so he demands it from all. The world must cede to him in its rightful place. But the reason for this is a mix of his birth and standing, and his values and what he sees as beautiful in the world. He is the culmination of that, and worthy of the crown as a result. Nature, 
and nurture. His mindset is deeply impulsive and erratic. He desires to satisfy his fancies, but that is very off the cuff and stream of consciousness. Mix that with his high standards and the horrific things that satisfy his urges, and we're in trouble. But the thing about him that I alluded to earlier is that he is unique. He puts on a smile, he is this marvel of a man, but part of what distinguishes him is this pure, seething malice and disdain completely unique to him. To me, he is easily the most truly evil character of significance within the story, and that is a big part of why he's terrifying. But while that sets him apart, an additional element to this is that he is so intentionally alone. He places himself in isolation, above all, and seeks out this solitude. Often disappointed and disillusioned with the world, he finds himself seeking solace and finding joy within that solace, indulging in his art with only himself for company. And this is different. Crollo is alone, but subconsciously yearns for more and deeply, truly cares for others. Meduem and his royal guards all form significant connections of some sort throughout their short lives. Ilumi is the way he is because of a toxic, dark love that he has for Kilua. Genthru has friends and harbors immense care for them. Pariston has this contradictory, paradoxical love for upsetting others, and outwardly acknowledges that he needs them to achieve this fulfillment. Even Hisoka forms connections of sorts and has no problems looking up at others, so long as he can bring them down himself or die in exile ecstasy trying. But Seti has no true, significant connections, and no qualms about that. The closest character to him in this regard is Gyro, but the latter is comprised much more of this dark conviction than genuine malice. Now, there is stated to have been a time where Seti had something resembling a group of friends. But in their reflections about him, it is shown that he has foregone the possibility of a life of warmth and affection. And they also state that it seems to be in his nature to do so. It seems that he was shown a path of light and friendship, but ultimately decided against it for his own machinations, ego, power lust, and pursuits. Like Meduem, after being born into a world and taking it for granted that others were to serve him, said he was shown a path of light forward. But while Meduem took that hand and realized that his life was conceived for this purpose, Seti instead decided that his life was a journey into the frigid heights of a throne comprised of death. He saw little value in anything else and seemingly has no qualms about foregoing connection. And if we compare him with another one of the most heartfelt characters in the story in Krapika, one who also forcibly tries to put himself on that path, his features are thrown into sharp relief. Seti seems to just be this devil of a person that keeps drifting back, whereas Krapika says that he will become one if it means restoring his clan's pride, but seems to keep drifting back to warmth. Seti collects eyes for aesthetics and art, while Kurapika does it out of heart, rage, emotion, and connection. Seti has been tempted by the light and resists, while Kurapika sees that light and cannot help but love it. Seti has these quote-unquote friends who care for him and want the best for him and would like him to step off his dark path, but know that it's likely futile. Kurapika has loved ones who know that his path isn't suited for him and harbor hope that he will not destroy himself. The two are inverse mirrors of one another. Now, this isn't to say that Seti doesn't have notable interactions with others, but I think that one of the most telling lines from him is given to us on the inside of the cover of Volume 33. When I become king, my first order of business is to separate the people into two categories. Useful trash, and useless trash. Not only does Seti think of humanity en masse as unworthy, disappointing, and far below him, but he thinks of them as garbage. He isn't just disillusioned, he is rageful. Consistent with an ever-present element of Hunter x Hunter, Seti thinks negatively about humanity, but not for the reasons that Meduem or Leorio do. And he goes beyond lamenting it into straight up calling everyone other than him trash. This is naturally due to his upbringing, but his opinions of the world are not ones that he came to mindlessly. He has simply seen nothing to prove to him that he is wrong and that all of humanity isn't trash. And that is key. The criticisms Togashi makes of humanity throughout the story were in some ways always tinted by positivity. Meduem makes very valid points about the state of the world, but then finds light, hope, and reprieve in Komugi and Netero. 
Despite spending a large amount of time criticizing humans, Chimera Ant also celebrates and emphasizes the positives. The election arc is prominent in how it damns modern politics, but offers a modicum of truth and hope through Leorio's role. Harriston even finds some fulfillment in humanity through his adversarial dynamics with Jing and Netero. Kurapika's crusade is punctuated by light. The Phantom Troop were left devastated by the malice of the world, but still found solace in one another. The list goes on and on and on. Every time a character or arc rightly criticizes humanity, it offers a counterpoint for balance, showing that all hope is not quite lost. But Seti sees no counterpoint within the story. Of course, he has some respect for artists and like-minded individuals of repute, but in his ultra-specific viewpoint, everyone who is not up to his own standards is trash. He only desires the very best, and that is him. And so it is all futile and worthless. The world is not worth salvaging beyond a few rare individuals, and even those are automatically beneath him. He strikes yet another comparison with Meduem here, in that he sees certain extraordinary individuals and believes them worthy of existence, but while Meduem's progression made it obvious that his viewpoint would evolve and adapt to see beauty in more people in such different ways, Seti restricts his own viewpoint and simply sees use or nothingness. And so naturally, he is alone. He has rejected connection and his old friends. He finds fulfillment in power, strength, and solitude. He finds people useful, but not fulfilling in any way in terms of who they are. Lording over them, fulfilling his aesthetic for a suitable world, and using them for art is gratifying, and that makes them useful. But people are commodities to Seti, and he doesn't look at people as people, but rather something lesser. Either worthwhile stepping stones to engage with, or not worth glancing at. And that isn't something you can say about any other notable character in the story. Gyro is reminiscent, of course, but I think we need a bit more details for him. And the closest to it is Hisoka, who you could also argue views humans as such, but he has a certain respect for special individuals on a level beyond Seti, which is part of why he yearns to take them all down. Seti respects extremely little, and due to the fact that those he would seem to show respect to are those he simply acknowledges as useful and worthy of a place in the world, this is a tolerance. But in terms of the characters in the story, everything is one form of trash or another. The world is trash, he alone deserves to stand on top, and he finds his fulfillment in that strength and solitude. Some trash is useful to him, if they share in his interests, contribute to his art, or assist him in some way. And some trash is absolutely futile. Anything that isn't him is trash, and trash is beneath him. So we have never had a character in the story quite like this. Hisoka similarly uses humans for tools and isolates himself intentionally. Krolo is similarly fascinated in certain aspects of humanity and takes to being a social chameleon similarly in a sort of way. Meduem has been in Seti's shoes in broad terms, been tempted by connection despite his original purpose in life. And Periston has a similar sort of dark, malicious energy. These characters all have parallels with Seti, but he is different from all of them in significant ways. Now, with this idea comes forth another interesting dynamic regarding Seti, because I have not mentioned this yet, but there is another character that would seem to find the world completely futile, for totally different reasons, but the sentiment is the same. Seti is the benefactor of the Hai Li Mafia family, of which Morena Prudo is the leader. An enigmatic woman who has learned to despise the world due to the cruelty of her upbringing and the brutality of her circumstances, she uses similar wording in describing the world and people around her. A dung heap. It is not made entirely clear why Seti is the benefactor of this family. One would assume it's simply due to the material way in which it strengthens his position in the succession war and provides him with manpower and influence. But why specifically the Hai Li family? Perhaps he simply sees them as the most fearsome and useful. But perhaps, he sees Morena as one of the most interesting pieces of trash he has ever seen. She is beautiful, intelligent, strong, and shares a similar misanthropic philosophy. Could he see a kindred spirit in her? As the two have not directly interacted in the story yet, it's impossible to draw a solid conclusion here, but it is very much worth pondering. Now the last thing to discuss here is his power, which is always worth a look in the series. Seti's ability is infamous for how it is depicted visually, but the long and short of it is that he's able to see the future as it is to happen, and alter his position within it to allow fate to occur in a way he intends. 
Essentially, he manipulates time and the future to reach a more desirable end for himself. Seti dictates fate, at least in a micro way. And this is entirely cohesive and consistent with his self-imposed authority. The world must cede to him. It is fate that he will reign supreme, and his own agency, conviction, will, and power are an organic and natural way to do that. All part of the plan. And it just so happens that the other character who is incredibly fixated on fate, who has obsessed over it, Krolo, is also on the ship to the Dark Continent. It is unsure exactly how these two's journeys will go, but this detail is enough for me to think that they will intertwine. And when you factor in the potential connection Seti may have to the underworld that Krolo and the rest of the spider were captivated with, things may heat up. In addition, Seti's Nen Beast is able to detect lies from others. All those before him must be honest and tell the truth. He detests dishonesty. He may end up being a fan of Leorio in that one respect, and uses this power to weed out the useless trash. You would imagine that Seti is a man that requires truth in all things. There is no art without truth. Everyone is his subject, and as such, no lying to him. So just as the case is with his power, he deserves the best in every regard, partly due to his influence and what he was born into, but that's only a slice of it, because he despises the majority of his siblings for their decadence and sitting on their laurels. He has worked himself into this position, and he deserves all that he believes will follow. Increased proficiency in Nen, the crown, the throne, more treasures, and art. Because he deserves it in every sense. Because of his blood, and his merit, nature, and nurture. It's how he's come this far, how he struck up impressive alliances, made beautiful works of art, and collected the scarlet eyes that even Karapika hasn't been able to obtain on his crusade. And this bit has very obvious plot implications, as he is someone Karapika is aware of and has his eyes on. Now of course, the protection of Oito and Wobble seems to have Karapika drifting towards the light, but it seems inevitable for these two to interact in some way, to bounce off one another in characterization and themes with Seri's collection, and perhaps his ties to the Korta incident or the Spider tragedy. As this arc goes on, will he continue to be the same person he's been? Or will he mirror Kurapika on this quest to be the Dark King of the Underworld, done for vanity rather than love? Will something cause Seri to shift right at the end and realize the beauty of connection and light and respect? A lot of Hunter x Hunter antagonists have in some way dabbled with that, at least to some extent. But as we've established, Seri is not like anyone else, so I wouldn't be confident in him doing so. But who knows? And adding to my lack of confidence here is his exponential proficiency in Nen and his rise in power. As Theta says, he is the last one in the world who should be allowed to master Nen, but she seems to be fighting an uphill battle to stop him. His powers and how they play into his psychology and characterization have been established, and now all that he needs to do is continue progressing. And what is clear is that in terms of potential, he is one of the most monstrous forms of evil the world of the series has seen thus far, and one of the most powerful characters. And him being this prodigy in Nen is no coincidence. He is blessed with a natural aptitude, intelligence, skill, and arguably most importantly, a strong core of identity and authority which gives his Nen shape. But he also has a confidence and natural resolve offered to him from his nature and upbringing. If he should live to allow his Nen to develop, it spells doom for many. But this is a long voyage with so many moving pieces, and if Hunter x Hunter has taught us anything, it is that the quote unquote strongest don't always succeed when it comes to Nen battles. So time will tell if that happens. Seti is similar to many throughout the series, yet completely unique and different from each one. He is core to so many plot threads and embedded in so many dynamics, yet unconcerned and independent. A precise mix of nature and nurture, aptitude and experience, philosophy and conceit, the epitome of malice and evil, uninterested in connection and warmth. Now, will he live to the end of this voyage and go on to reign supreme and turn the world into a bloody canvas? Will Hunter x Hunter's Dark King take the throne that has been prepared for him, or will he go out in an explosion of art worthy of the man himself? Despite being one of the most fascinating and impactful characters in the series already, there is so much more of Seti's story to tell, and it promises to be a tale as rich and twisted and captivating as the mark he leaves on us with his every action. Many thanks for watching.